Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Catholic Family News. I'm Murray Rundus, the Managing Editor and Production Manager here at CFN, and I'm very glad to be joined by Apostolic Majesty. Apostolic Majesty has a very great YouTube channel focused on history. He covers uh, everything from liberalism to the, the history of Rhodesia to the history of uh, of Britain to, to many different histories, and he's also been seen on other programs such as the Lotus Eaters. So uh, I'll to make things a bit easier, I'll use the abbreviation AM. How have you been? Uh, hello, Murray. Uh, yes, uh, I would insist that everyone use AM. I can't force everyone to say Apostolic Majesty every single time. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. You know, well, to really begin, you have a very interesting video that I think has sort of shaken things up. It's asked a very interesting question, and it's on a conservative or traditionalist vision of British republicanism. And I wanted to, to begin with the recent events in British politics, British history in the past two years, which has been really a monumental period. We saw a, a huge election over there with a decisive labor victory and a historic conservative loss. And of course, we've seen the coronation of King Charles. And I wanted to ask, have these recent events caused you to change some of your perspectives, some of your beliefs on what conservatism or a Catholic vision of traditionalism in uh, politics and in viewing the world has have these recent events caused your perspectives to change it's interesting that you you mentioned a couple of things there. i wouldn't actually say that my perspective or sort of my underlying political principles or even my historical outlook have really changed much at all um, in the last two years but what i like to do is not have my principles or beliefs beholden to anything which is a earthly institution if that makes sense so not parliament or the current iteration of the monarchy um but the reason i decided to sort of go along that tact of focusing on something like um british republicanism it was less to advocate for the idea you know espoused by people who commonly understand republicanism as basically the leveling down of all hierarchies etc to some sort of egalitarian baseline which is what egal what basically what republicanism is associated with now instead it was really to uncover how the mon what the monarchy is supposed to represent and how the monarchy has decisively failed and you mentioned interestingly enough the um the Labour, decisive Labour victory. Again, that's another point to note. Labour did not win a decisive victory. Labour won a victory by default. It only looks as if they won a decisive victory because of the number of seats, but actually they won fewer votes this time around than Jeremy Corbyn ever won in the previous elections where he lost rather decisively. So there is a general crisis in Britain. I mean, if you're coming you know, earnestly coming at this from a democratic mindset, and you're interested in things like high turnout, you're interested in things like a decisive electoral mandate, you have to look at the situation in Britain and lament how horrific things are. In the same way, if you're coming at this from a traditionalist point of view, you also have to lament um, how horrifying uh, things are. Really, this current situation is almost indefensible, regardless of what sort of um, episteme or intellectual paradigm you're sort of prefacing your, your views and your discussions with. Um, so that's how I've sort of encountered this. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say that my positions have changed. I think being a Catholic in the UK um, means essentially that you have a very sort of, you can almost say deracinated or detached perspective when it comes to the situation regarding the institutions. You know, a lot of Catholics will point to the year 1688, for example, and say that, you know, this is the fundamental turning point where when we focus on things like the state of the Catholic Church in Britain or the fate of monarchy, uh, everything is flipped on its head and effectively we become the opposition. We have to go underground. And really, you can say that that aspect of Catholicism in England has never really gone away. And so you can say that, you know, people such as myself are really the inheritors of a intellectual tradition that goes all the way back to the late six, uh, the late 17th century. And really, you can say before then to the uh, the schism that was brought about when uh, Henry VIII decided to um, uh, create the Church of England in 1534. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you know, you mentioned this tradition, which of course it's been a, a difficult relationship, Catholics in Britain, and there has been a connection with Catholicism and the Tory movement uh, going back. I mean, you, you can, uh, you know, of course, go back to even the the English Civil War, but you can also see a bit of a relationship with somebody like uh, Pitt the Younger in the 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 nineteenth century and the the eighteenth century. And I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned this this pseudo decisive victory that, that labor had, we did most certainly see a defeat for the conservatives in terms of splitting their vote with reform. And there's a, uh, there's a very bad sentiment towards the conservative party over there. And what I wanted to ask is we're, we're seeing moves against the monarchy. We're seeing a dissatisfaction with the monarchy. Do you think the conservative party, which has based its movement on having the, the principle of the, the hierarchy, the monarchy in Britain being established and strong, do you, do you see them as even having a future um, going forward now that the monarchy is, is being weakened and with this mass dissatisfaction towards the institution? It's interesting that you uh, come to this some association between the Conservative Party and the monarchy, because again, I think one of the reasons why, again, I'm drawn to this position of extreme skepticism when it comes to the in institutions and the ideas made manifest in monarchy is that I don't believe the Conservatives have a case for defending the monarchy. They don't have a case, say, for example, of preventing the House of Lords reform, which is going to be rammed uh, through over the next couple of months. Rather, they're essentially the party of inertia when it comes to the mm. constitution, um, partly because they realize that all the quote unquote constitutional innovations in this country are coming from the left. The left makes gains, the left consolidates its power and the conservatives simply react to it or in the worst cases consolidate the gains of their opposition. For example, there was no effort by someone like David Cameron to reverse the Lord's reform of Tony Blair the monarchy has always sort of drifted towards, you could say, defending the more leftist elements of the governments from, you know, Harold Wilson uh, all the way up until Tony Blair with um, Queen Elizabeth II. And that's why I situate the monarchy as being a quote unquote progressive ally where they go along with this. And basically the conservatives are consolidating the gains of the left as much as the monarchy really <laughs> are um, consolidating the gains of the left rather interestingly. The reason I've been rather disturbed and I've taken such a, um, you can almost say hostile position over the last few months is how that progressive dalliance has, you can say, accelerated, escalated into a position where it has become uh, synergy and um, how else would I describe it? Almost, almost like a symbiosis, a intellectual and political symbiosis between the aims of the monarchy, which tend to focus on the idea of taking the commonwealth, the multicultural globalist commonwealth, and taking the climate change agenda, meshing those things and trying to make them not just compatible uh, with the commonwealth charter, but also with the aims of the Labour government within the United Kingdom as well. And I haven't seen any sort of collaboration on that scale really in the history of the monarchy since the monarchy was actually a um, an active institution, if that makes sense. So what I find rather disturbing and terrifying at the moment is that we have entered a period of, you know, progressive acquiescence into a more formalized process of collaboration. And when both parliament and both monarchy essentially become a mockery of everything that they were supposed to represent in the first place, and when the monarchy is actively going along with this progressive project to the point that it basically concedes the whole egalitarian project for this government, and I don't mean egalitarian in a genuine sense, I mean it in a leveling play, playing field of um, all these sort of precedents and institutions that have come up to this point, uh, it really is rather disturbing. And I also really fail to understand how, unless you're looking at the monarchy from a point of view of inertia, or you have a rather childish view on history and tradition, how you can really not come to this conclusion, read the monarchy, and be as disgusted as um, people such as myself are. <laughs> If I may ask something that um, I think is a sort of natural consequence from this, is there, there's an apparent paradox. I, I say apparent because I think there's something underlying that, that makes it not so. But conservatism, traditionalism is something that's always favored hierarchy 
it's, it's favored the stable order that's established during Christendom and the institutions that underlie it. And liberalism, or the revolution, if we want to term it that, has always, as you've mentioned, uh, focused on this leveling, the leveling of the playing field. And the paradox is now they're, the conservative movement is forced to want to do the leveling and to make sure that the the these institutions, which have become fundamentally corrupt, are uh, in a sense leveled and, and replaced with good ones, while the liberals or the, the the revolutionaries are the ones with the institutions wanting them strengthened to assert their dominance. Do you see this as being an inherent weakness within the traditionalist or the conservative position? And, and what do you think underlies uh, underlies this rather than just a, a simple-minded, we support the hierarchy, we support um, whatever institution is in place? Well, when you sort of go back to, I think you can really say the German romantics and the, you know, really even before the French Revolution, but that's galvanized this position around the 1800s and the 1810s. The position is to look at the body politic, the institutions, as almost representing a living organism. And this would also represent the nation in and of itself. And they also, you can say, have a mythologized version of history, um, history as representing some form of um, grand sort of political agency, which of course is taking the idea that God is present in all things and they're sublimating this to something else, which isn't so clear as the idea that God is present in all things. And then you take this idea of organic developments, of historical progression, of the state as an organism, and then you hold, therefore, the institutions such as in this country, the monarchy, the church, the parliament, as representing a eternal tradition, which is associated almost with the the, the soil and the trees and the very sort of um, ecosystem the real ecosystem, the political ecosystem, as you're know, mirroring one each other. I think the most obvious example when you look at high Toryism is to see the crown um, situated within the oak, effectively, as if to come up with an image of essentially what I'm trying to um, explain here. Um, but the issue here, of course, is that the minute you take a more historicist point of view, the more you can almost say you take a more postmodern point of view, you understand that all of these historical developments essentially all take place within a certain context. You can't look at a institution which has lasted a long time and say that the context for the institution having existed 200 years ago is the same context for it having to exist now. And so the liberals are essentially able to use those institutions in a completely um, skeptical, cynical, you deracinated way and see how can we exploit this and how can we use this essentially to implement our program, which is completely against everything that I'm just trying to outline. But the conservatives have a difficult, I'm you know, speaking broadly, it doesn't have to just be Britain, it could be you know in Germany or it could be um, in America or what have you. The issue conservatives have is of taking this idea of an organism, an organic historical process, and being able to understand the hard political realities of what these things are supposed to be doing effectively, how they're supposed to be advocating for our cause or advancing our aims. And a lot of intelligent conservative thinkers cannot go beyond that sense of seeing that the institution has become antithetical to what it was supposed to be. And you can almost say it's a form of moral cowardice in the sense that they won't look at the institution and decide, okay, we need to go beyond this and we need to understand how we can create new things rather than simply be beholden to an almost fatalistic process of acquiescence to what has come before. And of course, this is, you can say, a debauched sense of Christian fatalism <laughs> if that makes sense. We are we are taking the idea of um, uh, essentially having ourselves beholden to the will of God. Instead, here, we're talking, us, we're talking about being beholden, say, for example, to the, um, uh, to the parliament, to the constitution, things like that. And it, it re when you think of it like that, it really does seem almost um, uh, heretical, doesn't it, in order to yeah. sort of um, venerate those institutions. So, and like I said, I do think it's all of these religious impulses that have been disconnected and sublimated into other things in a way that is actually really rather perverted. Mm-hmm. 
You know, much of what you're saying uh, comes from a favorite author of mine and a, a favorite author of yours, from my understanding, Sir Thomas Carlyle. I see the seedlings, the the beginnings of it in a lot of his writing. And, you know, it's it's you talk about another sort of paradox, something that doesn't apparently make sense, but then you can grab some more understanding, is Carlyle, who's this medievalist, he's this, in many sense, a... a uh, proto-traditionalists. Uh, he is at the same time a fan of, if we even want to say that, of uh, of Cromwell, which is something that might many Catholics, of course, are going to ab abhor, especially Irishmen. But it's something interesting because this brings me back to one of your latest video, which you mentioned that with the current order of things, a sort of Cromwellian spirit might be necessary in order to um, uh, come back to to a better sense of the institution. I'm hoping you could expound on that. Do you think that in what sense is a Cromwellian spirit necessary in, in order to restore order in Britain and in the West? Well, I mentioned uh, that almost um, under gritted teeth, un under gritted teeth, if that makes sense, course, because yeah. um, I have to. I find Cromwell and the whole sort of parliamentarian cause rather fascinating because the more I read into it, the more I'm completely convinced of the fact that Charles I was justified in doing what he did mm -hmm. um, and tried to face down Parliament effectively. But nevertheless, trying to look at this from, you know, a Carlylean point of view as to what motivated Cromwell, because Cromwell was actually a quite quite a late actor when it came to being, a, like you can say, an animating force behind the forces of parliamentarianism and then ultimately becoming the vehicle for um, British republicanism. Cromwell has to contend with these, you know, you can say more traditionalist aspirations towards being beholden to the monarchy and, of course, beholden to his own uh, distinct version of puritanical sort of Anglicanism, if that makes sense. And on the one hand, he is drawn to people like the fifth monarchists who believe that destroying the monarchy, the false monarchy of Charles I, will allow for the kingdom of God to come down and the Republic basically will usher in this, you know, new age where, you know, Christ will finally come down and descend onto earth and et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, he's looking at things like the Dutch Republic and saying, I, I want to turn England into a great commercial empire and things like that. Or, you know, oh, should I, should I become the king? Or, you know, is that going a step too far? Am I going to accept the crown that parliament's given me and become King Oliver the first? Or should I instead go for something which is less controversial, which is ultimately to assume the position of Lord Protector? So there is a, there, are, there is a lot of contradiction in the in the um, in the form of someone like Cromwell, but what I was trying to really advocate there is that Cromwell was looking at the what he believed the state of the institutions, the fallen state of the monarchy, and the fallen state of the church, and he was trying to use essentially every means at his disposal, which ultimately, in his in his manner, uh, went down to crude military force to try and restart things in England again. Basically, you can almost say that he tried to represent the most sort of pure iteration of what the Reformation in England should have been, not just in terms of creating a, you know, a purified version of um, English Protestantism in the country, but also establishing what you can say is the essence behind Henry VIII's um, uh, settlement of the Declaration of the Strength of Appeals, which is making in England an empire in and of itself. And this can explain his Irish campaign, this can explain his Scottish campaign, or his desire simply to be Lord Protector of England, but to establish a Commonwealth over the entirety of the British Isles. So Cromwell, you can say, represents um, you know, this revolutionary force against what he perceived to be the corrupt, or you can say the oxymoronic nature of the institutions, and also this drive to assert English sovereignty. So when I'm looking at an example like Cromwell, I'm looking at it in a very sort of, um, you can almost say a, a spiritual aspect. I'm looking at this in terms of realizing some sort of, you know, authenticity uh, in, when it comes to some sort of political program, if that makes sense. Um, but again, I, I, I try and draw back against this idea of drawing direct comparisons, because like I said, um, Cromwell ultimately I didn't believe was justified in his given situation because I'm saying all of these things with an asterisk next to them. And the irony is, is that I believe Cromwell, had he existed you know, today, would be far more justified 
in representing, you can say, that um, that great sort of revolutionary zeal in terms of trying to reify what he believed with the false promises, you know, that came out of the English Reformation. That spirit should exist now far more so than it should have existed back in the 1640s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You you mentioned that the the revolution is in a sense like an actualization of the Reformation or the the Protestant revolt, and this is something we we common commonly see in in Catholic discourses on history of the history of liberalism is pointing the origin point back to Protestantism or in England in the the schism created by King Henry VIII. But something I think seems very strange is the fact that the first true revolution, violent liberal revolution that established a a really a, a permanent liberal order and, and sparked these revolutions was of course in the Catholic France. And at the same time, the bulwark, the main adversary against that revolution was, of course, Britain in the form of the, the coalitions against Napoleon and that initial work uh, against the revolution. So how do we Catholics explain that the origins of liberalism really began in in France with the, the French Revolution and in, in the liberal revolt in Catholic France, while the main adversary was Protestant England? If the main, if we can find the the origin point of all of liberalism back in Protestantism, how do we explain that connection and that disconnect during the French Revolution? I wouldn't necessarily say there is that much of a disconnect. I mean, to follow on from your point about seeing the origin of Protestantism, it's. I wouldn't necessarily say it's correct to see like Luther as the harbinger of liberalism. I almost see Luther as the harbinger of the death of Europe, if that makes mm. sense. And by that I mean is that Luther, part of the genius of Luther was being able to attach his political and religious reformation to the desires of the German aristocracy, the German princes within the hierarchy of the Holy Roman Empire. And you can say that from their point of view, the true sort of culmination of the Lutheran revolution, Lutheran revolution, um, was the idea of um, aes, um, Caius Regio, Aes Religio, that a king has possession over the religion of his own domain, and he has the right to, you know, remove all heretics and banish them all out, and say, this territory is forever Lutheran, or this territory, for example, is forever Catholic. When it comes to France. France in the 16th and the 17th centuries actually has many mirrors with what the situation is going on with England, because they're in the grip of their own version of the Reformation. Essentially, during the 16th century, about 50% of the nobility go off and they don't become Lutherans, but they become Calvinists. Mm -hmm. And part of the Calvinist project is essentially is to gain control of the king and allow for them to have a series of you know massive grants and rights and religious freedom etc there's also the possibility of calvinism kind of like what we see with the anglican church which has many sort of calvinistic elements infused into it is that france would actually have its own schismatic re religious revolution which would mean there will be a church of france as there would have been a church of england and you can actually see this from a political point of view looking to the precedence of gallicanism etc they go all the way back to um uh, you know, King Francis I in the early 16th century. And of course, the settlement of Henry VIII was only 20 years later. So all of this is going on at the same time. It's actually really interesting to consider why Francis I didn't decide to fully embrace the Protestant, you know, revolution, reformation, and accept that whole baseline to establish his own sort of um, war against the Habsburgs and all that, who of course was sort of avowedly Catholic. So well, that's very interesting. But coming back to your point, because your point was focused on how can we reconcile that the revolution came out of nominally Catholic France and Protestant Britain then became some sort of bastion against that. So I, I've tried to outline essentially how the Reformation is responsible for divvying up Europe and dividing them into Protestant monarchical states and you know Catholic monarchical states. When it comes back to France, when it comes back to this idea of um, Caius Regio, Aes Religio, that really is, you can say, the political program of Louis XIV, you know, the exemplar and pioneer of French absolutism with his Edict of Nantes, forcing the Huguenots out into places like the Netherlands, into Prussia um, and into England. 
So with that essentially established, Louis XIV was able to create a consolidated monarchical regime with the nobility and the church basically on side. He had grander ambitions to create a new um, Catholic French imperial project in the 1680s. But by the time of his death in 17, um, 14, 1715, um, that was all you know beyond the pale when it came to the sort of uh, political possibilities that were open um, to him. But really what happens in France is strange is that the process of absolutism effectively, I believe represents again, one of these um, fundamental contradictions in terms of something that Catholics and political theorists really have to grapple with and understand, which is that absolutism is basically a, a plaster or a, or a band-aid effectively over the root causes or problems inherent in feudalistic and monarchical forms of government, which is fundamentally the breakdown in harmony between the first estate representing the church the second estate representing the nobility, and of course the monarchy. The failure of the church and the failure of the nobility to ally effectively with the monarchy means essentially that the monarch needs to accrue all powers to him. And that's effectively what absolutism means. Absolutism is just the state having the monopoly of violence. Then all of a sudden out of that, authority which was nominally vested in the church and vested in the nobility is now harnessed in the power of the king. And then the king begins to become the presider over a managerial state. And in the worst instances of this, the managerial state becomes so powerful that the king almost becomes irrelevant within this whole scheme. He is basically the legitimation of the system, but he doesn't represent that power which you would necessarily associate with absolutism. And so liberalism, in many ways, it creeps in to all of these you know, absolutist monarchical systems. Um, in the case of Germany, you can say it forms part of this bedrock of what was called um, uh, cameralism, which is basically chamber politics. You know, we are going to become liberal scientists of good government and that sort of thing. And when it comes to France, you can say that all of the, you know, religious zeal, all of the Catholic zeal that could have been there defending the monarchy was instead, you can say, diluted and sublimated into the sacralization of the state and of the government. You have to remember that in the French wars of religion, the Catholics weren't the Bourbons. It was the Saint Ligue. It was the Catholic League in France, led by the House of Guise. That were the Catholics. And Henry of Navarre, Henry, Bo um, Henry Bourbon, uh, Henry the Fourth, was a Protestant who only belatedly converted to Catholicism because he believed that Paris we were the Mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So you can say there are fundamentally many contradictions within the Bourbon monarchy. And really, what the Bourbon monarchy is almost—it almost represents something which would be similar to Hobbes. Hobbes in the sense that the state must remove all sort of, um, uh, you can say, civil strife, etc. There must be an absolutist system to prevent us disintegrating and falling back into a state of nature, which is the war of all, you know, the war of all against all effectively. The state exists to promote peace and all other things need to be sublimated to the idea of the king as representing peace. And that is effectively what absolutism is. But as you can probably see, once all of these ideas become neutered and the monarchy essentially becomes statism, then the whole notion of it really being Catholic almost becomes a secondary consideration. And this is what a lot of people in France were feeling in the 18th century, to the point that Catholicism had lost so much of its uh, intellectual influence and so much of his moral influence that when you have someone as debauched as Louis XV, the penultimate monarch of France, reigning for such a long period of time, given the fact that there is such a large section of the French population who are politically disenchanted and have no access to power because of the managerial nature of the French system, which is becoming very, um, you can say, covetous of holding on to its own power and preventing newcomers from coming in. When Louis XIV was in power, you have this mass ennoblement of people called the noblesse de robe, essentially people coming in and, you know, buying into the French political system and becoming, you know, managers effectively for the monarchy. By the time of the 18th century, the ladder has effectively been knocked under and there has been a social stratification. So there is a large number of people who are educated. However, they are not necessarily ingrained to this idea of, you know, France as a Catholic state, but rather they are looking to other sources. So you can almost say perpetuate and justify their own criticism of the French monarchy.
of the French government. And so they're in turn sort of led to people like Montesquieu and then ultimately to Rousseau. They become far more radical. And then their opposition to the absolutist system in France actually takes on its own religious dimension. But it's the religious dimension, you can say, of bringing back Gnostic and Manichaean elements. It is the revolution of, you know, um, it, it is dualism, effectively. It is we are one God facing against this false God, which is, you know, the Catholic monarchy in France. We are going to essentially build a new catechism, which is, you know, going to come out of Rousseau. We are going to vilify the institutions and say that, as with Rousseau, um, man is free, but everywhere he is found in chains. So you can probably understand that there is actually a very similar impetus with what's going on today and what was essentially going on with a lot of French thinkers, a sense of political alienation and we need to form essentially a new political movement or a new ideology in order to justify our criticism and you can say our own worthiness to actually replace this political system and the ironic thing is that absolutism, absolutism in France are basically won by the time of Louis XV uh, with de Mopo and his war against the Parlement. However, Louis XVI comes in and he wants to attempt to form some sort of assimilation between the liberals in France and his own sort of monarchical regime. And he brings in people like Terjo, who are going to, you know, be pioneers of free trade, etc. It lasts, you know, doesn't last very long, as you might imagine. And de Tocqueville makes a very interesting point, which is never was French absolutism as deplorable to the French middle classes as when it was at its most benign, effectively. In the same way that I think uh, Kenneth Clark, um, the art historian makes a, another a very important point, which is essentially what crippled civilization is a loss of confidence. And I think just before the French Revolution, you can see all the forces arrayed essentially as to what would justify that happening, is that French absolutism has hollowed itself out effectively simply to become the justification of state power. It is state power which is effectively very uneasy with itself. It doesn't have that same sort of moral legitimation or justification of the arguments that were around, say, for example, during the time of Louis XIV. At the same time, you have an energized counter elite that have you know, essentially formed in the in the salons of France. You know, reading uh, Diderot and Voltaire, etc. You know, etc. And Voltaire is necessary because Voltaire goes out of his way to basically mock all of the religious and sacred pretensions of the church and the state. And once something becomes the object of mockery, you can say it has lost all of that um, that great sort of um, uh, legitimating power with any any sort of political system. And so all of these people are there, ready to take power. Power. And when Louis the Sixteenth calls for the general estates to come in, they are there, and they are able to form their own parallel institutions, which then evolve into the National Assembly, etc. And then, you know, the process of the revolution sort of continues on from there. So, to look at France simply as Catholic, I really think you need everyone needs to interrogate essentially what Catholic is, because I, I'm very much of the opinion that there are very few earnest Catholic rulers in Europe during the 18th century. I mean. If you look at things like the suppression of the Jesuits, if you look at Marquis de Pombal in Portugal, if you look at um, uh, King, sorry, King Charles III in Spain, um, you look at even Joseph II in Austria, and definitely mm. if you look to more Protestant rulers like you know Frederick II of Prussia, they are all enamoured of this idea of enlightened absolutism, this idea that we are going to take the ideas of liberalism and the Enlightenment, and we are going to personify these ideas of tolerance of humanism of going beyond you can say the um parochial and backward nature of what is essentially catholic or religious politics of the previous century effectively and we're going to represent something which is higher than that france effectively you can say one of the reasons why the reaction in france was so visceral against the monarchy is because fundamentally france failed to achieve this absolutist enlightened regime under Louis the Sixteenth, and that again, I believe, is the cause and the failure of his father. So, really, you can say it is a complete loss of confidence among all of the Res Publica Christiana, all of Catholic Europe, which goes back to Luther. It goes back to the idea of the death of Europe, uh, Caius Regio es Religio, and really, when you pit the idea of formerly Catholic France against Protestant England, as you mentioned, you can really say that very cynically. William Pitt is basically using the cause of anti-revolution um, as a means basically of solidifying British power 
but also as a means to appealing to other coalition allies in Europe who also have a justification for going against the French Revolution and going against Napo and going against ultimately Napoleon. You know, it is that cause of holding on to their rights which allows them to stay and contribute more arms in the continent to fight ultimately seven wars against France before Napoleon is finally extinguished. Um, so that was a very roundabout way of you know answering your question. But effectively, what I see at the time of the French Revolution is that all of these distinctions, all of these certainties regarding the Catholic faith and the Protestant faith, um, you can say the religious zeal, the people who say, for example, um, you know, were inspired to form the Jesuit order, you know, St. Ignatius example, um, the people who fought in the Thirty Years' War, um, people like, you know, Henry of Guise, etc. The radicals are all dead, effectively, and what is left is something far more odious, not just to, you know, to the revolutionaries, but also the Catholics everywhere. And so the 19th century becomes this great political reckoning on all sides of how do we deal with this mess and how do we create something out of this from a leftist point of view, which is essentially to realize the true gains of the French Revolution that have been denied to us. And from the conservative, the traditionalist point of view, how can we understand how things went wrong and how can we find some mechanism or some system of actually rejuvenating Christian Europe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned something there very interesting. Uh, that, that whole bit was e extremely interesting. But when we're talking about Pitt the Younger's opposition and the, the British opposition to the French revolutionaries, to Napoleon, that really it had to do with mainly political motives, that it was not uh, primarily ideological. I, I think one has to say, though, that it it would have to become ideological as is in order to justify um uh, british identity as com as compared to continental identity even um do you then think that the the establishment of the the british institutions of british tradition was then on shaky ground for the for the entirety of the 19th century and then moving into the 20th century and what what must britain do to to come to solid ground in resisting liberal uh, liberalism rather than it just being a political politically motive motivated identity as comparing itself to its adversaries so, so is this a question which is sort of bringing us to modern day is that your intention yes yes um well it's that, that's quite a a difficult question really to answer i think um what I've tried to get across in a lot of conversations and presentations is this idea that English nationalism is uniquely wedded to this idea of faith and institutions, probably more so, and this is an Anglophone complex in America, this idea is inherent in the fetishization of the constitution, for example. Mm -hmm all rights and principles are sacrosanct because they were the founding fathers original intention and all that sort of stuff in england of course it's going back to the parliament and the crown in parliament and you know magna carta and the bill of rights and all that sort of thing this is almost unique in the european context because what france does effectively is that when you see all of these monarchical regimes in europe all the the enlightened absolutism etc the point essentially is jettisoning some of these institutions because they have become unwieldy, or in many cases they have become antithetical to the aims of you know the status you know the, the status effectively and the monarchs. So you know, in Austria and in Prussia and in Germany, parliaments effectively never hold that same sacrosanct position. And in France, because of the you can say the limited success of the French Revolution and then the various counter-revolutions after, France is basically left with this schizophrenic identity where it lurches from you know, Catholic, monarchical, back to rabid leftist revolutionary every, every decade or so, effectively. And it's still something that France is grappling with right at this moment when we talk about figures such as Le Pen and Mélenchon facing, you know, facing each other in the, um, in, the part, in the assembly after the recent elections. But when it comes to England, like I said, it, so much of English nationalism comes back to this idea of the fetishization of institutions. So the way that the British establishment gets around the uncomfortable questions that have been brought out by the leveling egalitarian concepts that have been brought out by the French Revolution is to basically win over 
the larger population in Britain by allowing them to buy into Parliament. So this is what we have with the Great Reform Act. We have, you know, hundreds of thousands of new middle class people are brought in and allowed to partake in a political system, which is basically the reserve of, um, uh, you know, you can say more liberal leaning aristocrats before then. There is still a aristocratic dominating element throughout all of, you know, British political history in the 19th century that I think is often... Um, uh, understated because you can see the triumph of the expanding franchise and parliament but essentially parliament goes through a series of reforms in the 19th century and the 20th century to expand the franchise to expand the number of people who are voting to allow more people to buy into the parliamentary system and it is the success of those reforms that have allowed a organization like parliament to survive and even by extension the monarchy to survive you know to limp on because they're constantly able essentially to time reforms um, at a certain point where they can prevent, you know, some sort of great revolutionary upheaval. The issue now is that you were able to sustain a system like that because enough people bought into it effectively. And those who, you know, were left outside essentially were brought into the system and given the right to vote. But now, effectively, I'm, I'm you know, I'm speaking generally, I'm speaking, you know, uh, I'm not speaking to specifics here. But now Parliament does not fulfill its basic representative function, if that makes sense. All of the main you know, forces or powers in this country are basically delegated to various NGOs or think tanks or authorities which are seen as extra parliamentary in the same way that the British government has essentially become more... Um, uh, how, what's the best way to describe it? Um, it has effectively become removed from the institution. Basically, as we saw during COVID, the government can, you know, do it at once on an almost dictatorial basis and parliament will essentially give them a carte blanche to do everything they would want, which is, you know, kind of remarkable, but there we are. So, so long as people no longer feel that parliament represents them effectively, that original fetishization, which has allowed parliament to remain as such a um, enduring institution that is now on its last legs effectively and I brought up the labor example early on to really prove this if you have a government with a absolutely massive majority in which only 20 percent of the electorate supported that and it's only the case because the, the, the incumbent party lost and of that 20 percent they aren't enthusiastic either then all of a sudden you have a major democratic constitutional crisis on your hands mm -hmm. the only other institution to turn to then is effectively the monarchy and the church the church in england is you know led by someone who is very sort of busy you know heaping the uh, his own funeral pyre and the monarchy in england as i've said uh, has a outgroup preference it is instead focused on the commonwealth it is focused on the idea of appealing to countries which are not England, which are not Canada, which are not Australia, and which are not New Zealand. It is instead focused on the eternal outgroup. And you know, one example I, I brought up before is this idea of a um, a dispute between then Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, um, the Indian Prime Minister, fighting for England to have the Elgin marbles, while Charles goes and uh, combats him wearing a Greek tie, effectively mm. a Greek flag tie. All of these little things where. If the king no longer represents a people, which effectively is what, what a king is, there is a sacred element to a king, and then there is a tribal element to a king. If the king doesn't represent something sacred and he doesn't represent something tribal, he doesn't represent effectively the clan, the people, which is England. Instead, he represents everyone else in the same way that parliament has basically become dispossessed of its legitimating function and something that has kept it so successful which is the idea of expanding the franchise then you have a complete crisis and the only people defending these institutions are basically faced with some sort of a grand historical and political um uh myopia mm -hmm. no i think it's absolutely certain that it's uh it's a, a dire states for for really the whole west in general because i think that outgroup bias um exists everywhere and so uh, apostolic majesty this has been a, a very interesting conversation and there, there's a lot more to be said here uh which you talk about frequently over on your channel where can people find you uh thank you murray yes people can find me on youtube um apostolic majesty 
Um, I have a Twitter account, account uh, at Royal Apostolic. I don't really use it to focus so much on history, so I'd instead uh, recommend that you check out my uh, YouTube channel. And just to say uh, thank you very much for having me on. It's been an interesting discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll have a link to both of your accounts there in the description here. And if you want more interviews like this for our audience, you can subscribe here at Catholic Family News or go over to our locals account, catholicfamilynews.locals.com. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And for our audience, may God grant you many joyful years.